everybody and welcome to another episode of the Anfield Talk podcast. It's your host Ryan and I'm joined by one of our regulars, Chris. Chris hasn't been feeling too well recently, but he's a <laughs> tough cookie. I'm sure he'll carry on. <laughs> and today we are also joined by one of the most iconic reporters in football. For more information on this, we'd like to go live with our Touchline reporter, Jeff Reeves. <laughs> Boys, what, a, what an introduction. I couldn't have scripted it myself. <laughs> well... Thank you, obviously, for taking the time out of your schedule to come to speak to us down here on the Anfield Talk. Jeff, first things first, how are you doing? How's life in lockdown? Obviously, we're in our second one now. How are you coping? Uh, listen, like everybody else, lo- lockdown is not good uh, for anybody. And it's clearly a lot worse for others, for health reasons, for financial reasons, for mental health reasons brothers so yeah it's clearly no fun at all but comparatively I'm absolutely fine because without sounding sanctimonious I'm one of those who still gets to go to football I work at football and I'll be at Anfield on Sunday evening <laughs> so yes it's not great but I'm more than well aware which I was to be honest with you, even before lockdown that um, any complaints I have about my life Oh, very, very small beer indeed in the grand scheme of things. Well, it's funny you mentioned sort of health reasons because ironically enough, the only reason I'm able actually here to record this podcast is because I've currently got coronavirus or I'm on the tail end of it because um, I usually work in a school and so I would be preparing for the end of the day at the moment. But um, uh, unfortunately, I'm uh, locking down myself so I'm able to have this wonderful conversation with you fellas. But um, yeah, speaking specifically about sort of the football end of it, obviously, you're right in saying you're very lucky in that regard. But I know from a a viewer's end, it's a very bizarre experience. And I don't know about Ryan, but I myself can't stand the fake stadium noise. How is it though being... I've got to watch it without it. Yeah, exactly. How is it though being in the actual stadiums without the fans? Do you get the sort of same positives we do in sort of really enjoying just being able to hear sort of the uh, communication between the players and sort of maybe get into the tactics of the game? Or was that always the case for you? And it's just a really bizarre experience. No, you, it's, listen, let's, let's be clear about this. It is so much poorer for not having fans there. It's mm-hmm. absolutely uh, not what we want. It's second rate by comparison by a long chalk. We're desperate for fans get back safely as soon as possible because you just don't have the, the games don't have the same intensity they don't have the same feel they don't have the same drama I mean don't, don't get me wrong we've seen some good games we've seen some good football but nobody will convince me that being able to hear the players speak or hear what the managers are saying uh, in any way compensates or is you know is a bonus for not having the fans there it's just it, it's it's just really, it, it's nothing like what we're used to. The, fan, the fans are so important. And they, it, it's interesting to see how different clubs and different players cope without the fans or don't cope without fans. It affects different teams in different ways. But, you know, I, I can't pretend for, for one second <clears throat> that it's anything like as good as it normally is. Mm. Yeah, and this football without fans and um, post-lockdown and the coronavirus era, shall we say, of football, it's not been great from the manager's perspective, I guess, because we've seen players getting injured more frequently, scheduling's been a bit hectic. Um, (laughs) What's your opinions on that, um, Jeff? Well, you don't like to see players injured. The schedules are very different and we've seen a rise, I think it's a 35%. Increase in muscular injuries, injuries. So wow. that's obviously a concern. But at the same time, I would also say where they can that the managers who, you know, they want to protect their players as well. They make they've got to make different decisions in that they've probably got to use far more of their squad than they would ordinarily. Um, and it's being bold enough for some of them at the right moment. Well, I'm not sure that's the right expression. It's a dilemma as to 
who they play. Because as you know, there's no easy games. There's no given games in the Premier League. There never is. And we've seen some absolutely crazy results so far in this current lockdown. But where, where, when are do players get a rest? Where, where, where does that happen? Which they need. You know, these these are highly tuned athletes who cannot perform to their optimum twenty four seven. It's not possible. But at the same time, it is the same for all of the clubs. So those with the bigger squads, it's now about judicious use of their entire squad. Mm. Yeah, we I, spoke to... Um, the days, where we are at the moment, well, quite often, the you know, first question I'll put to a manager is, uh, and before the latest spate of injuries, Jurgen Klopp had started saying, he, he was, without using the specific words, he was hinting at, you can no longer regard of having a first eleven, or players aren't necessarily dropped or left out. They are genuinely rotated because this has nothing to do with how poorly or indeed well they played in the previous game. It's because he's got to, he's got to have a mind on their bodies uh, and, and injury prevention. It's, it's mm. almost become a joke. Um, I don't know if you've been following along sort of across the international break on Twitter, Jeff, but there's literally been a, essentially a competition running between City fans and Liverpool fans as to, Who's going to win the title of most injuries to to their players by the time the uh, international break ends? And the last time I checked, we both had had seventeen first team players injured or removed for Corona at that point. Just um, this is what a couple of months into the season. It is it is a bit obscene, isn't it? Um, well, sort of obscene is the right word because don't forget you've got. Uh, the, come up, the current Premier League champions and the former Premier League champions. So you're talking about, on paper, the best two clubs in this country right now. So understandably, their sides are going to be jam-packed with full internationals. So because they've got a higher percentage of players, they're going to have a higher percentage of injuries. Very true. That's what, when, you've got, when you've got the best players, there is call on those players. Jeff, what's your opinion on the possible introduction of five substitutions? Because we spoke to Des Kelly earlier this week and he was one that was all for it. But we've had a few people in the in the press and media recently, such as Andrus Townsend, that don't think it's fair given that certain squads might have, like you said, international quality players. But at the same time, these managers that are asking for it aren't necessarily using all three subs at, in every match. So... It might no. just be a bit of excuses from some managers. Some managers might genuinely think they need it. What's your opinion on it? Well, I think what needs to be addressed here is who's making the decision. Now, the decision is made by the Premier League. The Premier League is not a body in its own right. The Premier League is made up of the 20 Premier League clubs. So the 20 clubs vote. Now, if you think about that actual vote, that will be... A com I would pretty much guarantee a conversation between the manager of each club and the chief exec or whoever is going to represent the club at the vote. So said, so when um, high-profile managers or managers such as Frank Lampard or Jurgen Klopp or Pep Guardiola say, it's ridiculous, why in this country are we not, why are we not having five subs? Well, I, I would address that question to your fellow manager. Mm -hmm. I'd address to the managers of the clubs who voted against it and ask them because they're the ones who voted against it if you were, mm. if you were responsible for the decision though say it was a a flip of a it, it was your choice to make would you give it or not just on a personal level if i if i what whether to have the five subs or not yeah yeah i would i i, I would i would use the five subs yes i would I think because because of the schedule and some something has changed in the the um, the amount the, it's not the amount of the games being played that it's the because most of the games are now being the, because the games are free to air so they have to be played on different days so something has changed in the competition so I would yeah I would 
I would I would have more subs. I think you got you got you can't. I don't think you can look at the increase in muscular injuries, shrug your shoulders and say, oh, "Well, that's one of the, them things," and not do anything about it. Mm. Absolutely agree. So, one hundred percent, it is. Mm. It, it, there is a marked correlation, shall we say, between just the hectic nature of the schedule. And I think it's interesting you bring up sort of the, the TV side of it, because you're right. In, in as many ways as it's wonderful for sort of fans to still get to see their teams. And obviously now that the uh, pay to watch sort of aspect has been sidelined, everyone can see their team as much as that is great, it does completely sort of shuffle what was a fairly regular sort of order from the past several seasons. So I, I, I take your point on that. It's a very interesting sort of possible other cause, I suppose. Jeff, it wouldn't be a conversation about football in the year 2020 without talking about VAR, of course. <laughs> um, we're Liverpool fans... Unfortunately for us, we've had our fair share of awful, should we say, decisions go against us. As have everyone, to be fair. Yeah. They say, they say it should even up by the end of the season, but it doesn't really work out that way. <laughs> um, to us, at least, how it feels. But, um, Jeff, how do you feel about VAR and how it's used in the Premier League? I said before VAR came in, I said, be careful what you wish for. You're not. You are not going to introduce perfection. It's just not. It's just not going to happen. I think goal line technology has been excellent because it's factual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ball has either crossed the line or it hasn't. Uh, and this, this, I find if this, uh, you, you do see some people accuse um, television of driving VAR because we were, in their opinion, forever criticising referees. Well. Trust me, I've done plenty of interviews pre-VR with managers and players who didn't hold back in their frustration and their fury uh, at the officials. No, the officials weren't perfect. Is what we've got any better? No, absolutely not. I think, I, I think if it's too late, but if we could turn back the clock, I wouldn't have it. I, don't, I, no. I, think, it does, I think it does more harm than good. The delay, the celebration, this is only my opinion, the delay in the celebrations checking and when you see Patrick Bamford ruled offside for pointing where he wants the ball <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm so, sorry but at that point he just you, you just shrug your shoulders and you say well the lunatics have taken over the asylum that's just and anyone who can't see that then I, I, I don't understand their thinking I also think a lot of is done is done to help referees but I don't think it's helping them at all. I don't think yeah. it's helping them at all. I don't, I don't, I really, I, I think, I think, I would actually admire uh, football or the, or the relevant authorities, IFAB, if they said, do you know what? We've got this wrong. We invested all this money. We've got this wrong. So let's, let's revert. Also as well, if you, you think as well, I like the fact that if you were playing Sunday football or Saturday afternoon football yourselves as amateurs, if you've got a ref and two linesmen, you're playing under the same conditions as a Premier League team. It's not, it's not okay. So I think it's been, I think, to be honest with you, I think it's been a huge mistake. Do you think it could be modified then in Ivo in a certain way? Because like I remember when I think it was one of the first games we had VAR, Raheem Sterling scored against West Ham, but he was marginally offside. And that brought up the conversation of how offside should be offside in regards to VAR, because like for <laughs> half an inch, maybe you're being a bit over the top. But my opinion on it was if you're offside, you're offside, but now we've seen with VAR. The angles, the lines, the replays, they're not really definitive. So I don't think it's fair for either team to use that as evidence, should we say, of a player being onside or offside. But in regards to certain things like um, a potential red card where the ref could have a look at a TV screen and be like, OK, I missed this, fair enough. He should be sent off or I got this wrong. He shouldn't be sent off. I think that's, that's one of the positives of VAR. But yeah, we can... <laughs> 100%. But... You, you, 
you've got to you've got to limit it. You know, leave it with the the lines, uh, the assistant, the referee's assistant. Leave it with the referee. If you want to have another quick look at it, fine. But I, I mean, I, I, it also as well at the moment, this letting play go on when somebody's patently offside, they go through and they not they, it, they flag. Now I understand why they're doing it because what they don't want to do is flag and then actually it would have been allowed. Because sometimes when it looks clearly offside, you take, you take it back and everybody's surprised. Actually, they're onside. The timing of the run, it could be almost be like an optical illusion. But uh, no, not for me. Um, I Look, it's a bit like saying about social media and the negatives and the positives. The genie's out the bottle. It ain't going back in there. So it's going to stay around. VAR, I think we're stuck with it now. Do I think it has improved the game? No. Fair enough. You mentioned there you had a you you sort of have a good relationship with referees and you've made a point of it in the past. Do you think it's fair the stick referees get for making the decisions? Because obviously you have a good rapport with them. You speak to them pre and post match that kind of thing, especially with the extra scrutiny of VAR, what is your opinion on sort of the stick referees get? Well, you know, one of the beauties of football, it's all about opinions and it's about, and it's just what we talk about afterwards, before the game, after the game, that is part and parcel of the theatre of football and referees are part of that. Do I believe that the referees get the respect that they deserve? No, I don't. I've said, I've said that for, many, many years. There are good referees, there are bad referees, and there are also excellent referees as well who, who manage really, really well. I think they are held up to an extremely high level of accountability and indeed scrutiny because if, you know, if a ref makes a mistake, it's immediately... But if you take whoever you support, your best, your best player on your team, I guarantee you, every game they've played, they've either mis misplaced the pass or shot woefully. They've, done, they've made a mistake, and they're not held accountable in the same way. So, uh, and the reason I I back the refs is because I see them and speak to them a lot, and they're in many many ways they're just like players. They want to get it right. They really really do care. They're not arrogant. They're not aloof. They really do care. And often they'll be walking down the tunnel half time, they'll have given a big decision, and they'll sort of sideways glance at me or uh, my colleague, the floor manager, as if to say, Do you know, get it right. And you only got to give them that little nod and literally mm. they pump the air. They're so pleased. Mm. Extra relief as well. They're so pleased they've got it right because they're professional and they care. And when you don't give them the nod and you're basically telling them, mm, got that one wrong, they're absolutely gutted absolutely gutted so anybody who says they don't care the decisions don't affect them they don't know referees and they don't know what they're like to be around i have to say i agree with you because i've sort of been brought up playing rugby and obviously the whole mentality around referees in that sport is entirely different and i personally think that if sort of the dissent rulings were upgraded to a bit more of a hefty sort of punishment in the same way that you just can't speak to a ref like that in rugby. I honestly think that that's one of the things that would almost certainly improve the game. I wondered sort of what your take is on that and sort of how the difference maybe could be made, could I be said, an improvement. I've been, I've been saying the same thing for 30 years. We did a football where we had on an umpire, a rugby ref and a football ref. And it's just ridiculous, the dissent that is dished out to football referees. I mean, you've only got to look at that clip of Nigel Owens when he brings in the captain and the forward. Mm -hmm. And he says to the... He says, if I, if I even see your face again in this game, there will be serious consequences. And, and, the, and the player is embarrassed by his own behaviour. And, of course, he never saw him here. And that was probably for a little bit of yapping probably for a little bit of yapping. And unfortunately, they don't enjoy the same respect in football and they're not held in the same respect either. Do you think they're protected by the Premier League and the FA at a good level that they should be? Because 
like with regards to certain referees getting um, incorrect decisions in um, retrospect of what's happened, I feel like they're protected well in terms of the Premier League don't like to say too much about it. The, the, refs, the refs don't do any talking themselves and then they just get on with it next week and people like almost forget about it. But there's some cases where a ref might get a bit of a reputation by certain clubs where they, the fans might feel rightly or wrongly that they don't get a, um, fairly um, fair decisions. But the, ref, the referee might be refereeing them again later on. Do you feel like so they are protected well by the FA? I, I'm not sure that they're pro either protected well or protected badly. Well, certainly, I don't think that there's an agenda there. It's funny, Jamie Carragher was telling this story the other night. He said how there was a game where um, he complained either to the referee or said something about him. And then a week or so later, they had a penalty given against them. And Jan Mulby called him. He said, that was you trapping off <laughs> or about that ref. That's why that got given against it. And Jamie said, I'll never criticise referees after that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I, can, I can believe that uh, of yesteryear. I don't, think, I don't think refs go into games now at all with what either happened in the previous game um, or, or I, I, just don't, I just don't think they feel like that. I think it's possible if you think about it for referees. So when you question um, so, for instance, this, this, David Coote has been taken off of VAR, hasn't he, for this Sunday? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you could, you, you, could, you could look at that two ways. You could say, well, you know, you, you can start imagining all sorts of conspiracy theories as to why he's been taken off. But what if David Coote, going into that game, because of what happened previously, felt under so much pressure, he couldn't mm -hmm. actually perform to his optimum level and actually another person so he was rotated on to do that game and another person would actually potentially perform better than him on the day so on that basis it's right that he's replaced mm. it's not it's not personal to david I agree. Yeah. Not, it's, it's certainly not an attack on his integrity or his ability but if he went into that game thinking oh my word liverpool again after what happened at Goodison, if I don't get if I don't get everything hundred percent right, I'm, I'm, he he could be under intolerable pressure. Uh, so it's probably more. It's, I don't think it's a big deal. It's probably more appropriate that somebody else uh, has VAR that day. I'd say I agree, because much as I was not a fan, shall we say, of the decisions that were made in the Merseyside derby, I think. And this is true of all fan bases. I think sometimes you just need to consider the people because there are a lot of people who will be uh, raising a glass, shall we say, to David Coote being taken off because of what happened in the Merseyside derby for a completely different reason to the one that you've just outlined there. And I think sometimes you just, obviously, you're a major proponent of mental health in sport and mental health in general. I think sometimes people just need to consider that you know these are real human beings with faults and i think it's just a bit sometimes people take it a bit far but anyway <laughs> so obviously jeff you are a absolute statesman of the sport and sports journalism you've been at sky since the inception of the premier league all the way back in uh, 1992 i just we well, were just wondering Back then, at the very start, in terms of sort of the Premier League and the relationship with Sky and how televised and mediaized, I suppose, the sport has become, did you see this coming at all? Well, the size of the Premier League? Mm. No, I don't think anybody could have predicted that. Uh, I think we knew that it was, it was a new concept. Uh, being treated in a different way, being marketed in a different way. Uh, the amount of live games on television was obviously very, very different as well. Could we have foreseen its popularity on a global basis? No, nobody could. Obviously, we, we hoped for the best and we wanted it to go well. Um, but it wasn't, it just wasn't, 
I don't think it was, it was you know, if you, if you took the actual numbers, you know, what, what was paid for the first contract and what's paid now, the overseas rights, it, nobody, would have, nobody would have anticipated that. It would, it, I think it would have been impossible to predict. It's interesting. Um, it makes me think of sort of your comment about the, uh, the genie it being out the bottle. Now, uh, I think that was another moment where that kind of, it kind of almost went over a hump and then never, never looked back. Yeah, well, I don't think anybody wants the genie back in oh, the bottle. Absolutely. People. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yeah. one's, a, one's a positive, one's a negative. You know, the amount of... Again, going back to the current scenario in terms of COVID, I was talking to a, a club. I think I was talking to a manager and a player the other day and we were talking about it. On the one hand, going into a game, you you have to put it into perspective when you talk about maybe who's going to play left back this week and there's it's fairly indistinguishable between the two candidates who's and how important that decision as to who's played left back when whatever else is going on in the world right now but then set against that people's lives right now are very very difficult and football alongside, alongside other sports as well does provide 90 minutes or more of relief against um, the drudgery that's going on right now. So they want to take it seriously. They want to have the same passion. They want to have the same discussions as well. So it's about, it's about perspective as to what football is right now and its place in society. Mm. I guess hand in hand with how big the Premier League has got over the years, we're starting to see a lot more coverage and getting closer to the players as fans. Um, like, for example, through social media and little bits clubs like to do now to give more coverage of what goes in behind the scenes. Um, another aspect of that, I guess, is the interviews that we're getting because back, I'm sure, in the inception of the Premier League, players weren't getting their pre-match, post-match um, interviews like they do now, their midweek ones. Um, do you feel like it's a bit of an overkill for managers and players getting interviewed this much? Um, because obviously you'd think they just want to concentrate on the game, but at the same time they know they've got to do their duty. What do you, how do you feel about that? Well, it's a very different landscape to when we first started out in 1992. Mm in that the interviews were not actually contractual. So they were by grace and favour. And if a manager didn't want to talk to us, he didn't want to talk to us. You know, on, on a, we used to ask them, if, would they mind doing a quick word for us? Majority were, were fine and were helpful. And they understood that we, this was going somewhere different. It was going to a different place. So I, I, absolutely, I, I get that completely. Um, don't forget as well, a lot of, for the overseas market, uh, it, it, it for, for, there's a huge amount. Sorry, the overseas market. There's a huge amount of interest from hearing from the players pre-match and post-match, and the managers as well. And then you know, they build up to the game. They they they're used to it now. They're so they're so much more used to it. They're conditioned to do it. And it's no different from other sports. If you take baseball, American football, they're all interviewed pre and post as well, because. The fans, they, uh, again, I've, all, I've always said this, most in, the most important people in football are the fans. Always have been, always will be. They, indirectly, they, uh, at the top level of sport, they are the ones that fund it. Whether it's attending matches, buying broadcast subscription, you name it. Without the fans, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. As we're finding out, but they're not being... <laughs> yeah, but- not in, not in the stadiums. The fact, the fans. You can't. You cannot disregard fans. So, for instance, fans. When you know, they, if they want to hear, if, if the fans have made it clear, abundantly clear, and the feedback we get is that fans want these interviews, then the, the fans should hear it. Do you think the fans get treat, treated fairly then? I guess by um, the Premier League and um, the FA because um, going back about a month or two ago, they brought in pay per view matches that as I'm sure you know, didn't go down too well with the fans. And it's almost like a bit, I feel personally feel like it's a slap in the face to fans because we're not allowed in the grounds. And so all we can do is watch the games. And then it's almost like, okay, if you want to watch the games, here's £15 to watch your team this weekend on top of your Sky bill, your BT bill and your 
TV license for match of the day. Do you feel like it's a bit ridiculous that that was even taken as an option, even though it wasn't too long? But yeah, you'd have you'd have to ask the people, which is is the clubs. You'd have to ask them. Um, I mean, don't forget as well. We are, we are. I, I, I just think I, I felt personally it was. If you, if we are in unprecedented times, we're in a pandemic at the moment. So, you you've got to say, right now with everything that's going on, where people's income has taken a severe hit in large swathes, you you'd have to question whether or not that was the right time to do that. Mm. One thing I think should be said as well um, is essentially the whole pay-per-view sort of fiasco, shall we say, as it ended up being, has proved one thing you've just said very correct, which is that ultimately it's the fans who are the be-all and end-all because they essentially voted with their wallets and you saw sort of ridiculous numbers being raised for food banks and that kind of thing Brilliant. instead. Brilliant. Uh, it's just no, thought it was brilliant. It's proven essentially what you've said, which is that fans ultimately, if they believe they have the control, they can take the control and they can really influence the game they love. And that honestly, it's one of my favourite things, sort of about the era of lockdown football, is seeing sort of the fans got list, use their voice. A list, a list of favourite things in lockdown. That must be some list. <laughs> it's not a very long one. <laughs> But it is a, it's it's a it's a nice sort of glimmer of hope that I found very important, shall we say, in the past few months. Now, what they did with the food banks was was uh, uh, all sorts of different clubs. I thought was amazing. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And um, Jeff, at Sky, you've got almost a bit of a dynamic partnership with Martin Tyler with him introducing you to the touchline and you giving us your um, information that we as fans can't get, um, and amongst numerous other big names. Um, who has been your biggest inspiration or influence in your career? Was there anybody that you look up to in the industry or was it something that you just stumbled upon and thought, I could do this myself? <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> uh, no, all sorts of different people, from people I worked with right at the start at Sky. I'm never, I'm never particularly one for naming individuals um, because it's unfair on the ones that you don't name. You can take, you can yeah. take, you can take. Um, really, you, you can you can take inspiration from a wide range of people, which I certainly do. Uh, and I admire certain broadcasters and the way they operate and and their work. And that's not just within the field of football. It's in, it's in a wide range of fields. But yeah, I think it's always I think it's always good to have role models and inspirations. But I also I'm a great believer in life. It's always best to be yourself because I think you'll find everybody else is taken. <laughs> Wise words. Now, obviously, we are a Liverpool site. We're a Liverpool-based podcast. We have to ask you about Jurgen Klopp. Obviously, how is your relationship with him as a man, as a manager? What What is your opinion of Jurgen Klopp? Because obviously ours is, is very positive. Uh, yeah, my, my, mine too is very positive. He's, uh, you know, he's... he's First of all, he's a successful manager. So on that basis, you respect him for what the teams he's overseen, both here and in Germany, and the job that he's done. On top of that, he's a good interviewee. He doesn't just give bland answers or cliches. He says good things. So that's good. And also the fact that he was, for a long time in Germany, a television pundit, I think it gives him more of an affinity with our industry because he knows how it works. He knows he knows the game. I mean, half the time when he arrives at interview, he knows the questions he's going to be asked. Now, that's not meant as a slight on myself or indeed any of my colleagues 
who do a similar job. It's just that he knows editorially, he knows the agenda. And there's nothing clever about trying to find something really different to ask him because it might not be appropriate uh, in terms of the editorial narrative. But no, he's, he's Jürgen is sure, Jürgen's great for TV, really, really good for TV. And um, obviously he's a very passionate individual. I mean, I think of the Origi goal against Everton in the 96 minute and he just sprints onto the pitch, not really know where he's going. But obviously there's a flip side to that as well, where he could sometimes be quite emotional in another sense and can sometimes be quite angry. And I'm thinking of sort of the City game last year, just after we won the league, we lost 4-0 and he was quite annoyed. And in the interview you had with him, he was sort of insinuating that you're trying to lead the conversation in the, in the sort of a certain direction or narrative. And there's been other managers who've sort of made the same sort of claims of, uh, that you've got like Jose Mourinho talking about the campaign. How do you feel about sort of these kind of comments and sometimes this conception of interviewers? Because obviously perhaps that is true, but also isn't that not the job? Yeah, listen, I know a lot of people ask me about that particular interview. I had no qualms whatsoever about uh, Jürgen's demeanour, uh, what he was saying, or it's, you know, you can't expect someone to be sweetness and light. If you, if you are going to capture the emotions, it's the same with players. Bear, bear in mind, when I, get, when I go to work, I don't call it that, it's laughable. When I go to do a game, I can't call it work. When I, when I go to do a game, post-match, there's going to be, a majority of the time, there's a strict divide. Half the people I'm going to be speaking to are going to be happy as Larry, um, delighted with their work, delighted with their team and everything that went on. The other side will be the opposite because they got beat. So it's, it doesn't take a genius to work out that 50% that you talk to are not going to be particularly happy and not overly keen on talking about why they're not happy. But, but if you accept the plus side, you have to accept the negative side as well. So I have no qualms whatsoever about what uh, Jürgen, whether he's in good mood or bad mood, you're there, you're in the moment. So no, no problem at all. In fact, quite often you can get, not in that particular instance, but you can get a better interview um, from a losing manager because they can say some really insightful things as well. So yeah, you have to... Uh, you have to treat them both the same, you know, for, for, for what they are, in that they are their emotion, their human emotion, they, they care, and there's an awful, there's an awful lot at stake as well. Mm. Jürgen's not the first manager you've had a run in with, and I'm sure he won't be the last. Um, but when well, these things <laughs> really Sorry, yeah. over nearly 30 years, should it? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so when these things happen, Jeff, does it ever affect your relationship with the individual off the off camera? Or is it more of a strictly what happens on camera happens on camera and we just get on with our lives afterwards and everything's fine again? Yeah, there's a, there is a bit of a misconception. Even Okay, so the, the one you were talking about, Man City, that was um, a fairly frosty encounter. But there's no... Uh, when the camera turns off, you know, heated exchange or jabbing the chest or anything like that. Mm. But equally, sometimes when an encounter hasn't been straightforward, when the camera turns away, manager or player say, well, hang on, I think you're a bit so-and-so. And I or somebody in my position will counter, well, this, this and this. There's quite often in that scenario, which is fairly rare, a discussion afterwards, but also at the same time, 90% of the times when Pip says, oh, that looked difficult, that was a tricky interview, player or manager, it's no problem at all. Nearly always ends with a handshake. Mm. Um, and quite, not so much, obviously not at the moment, not at all at the moment. Quite often as well, you, you go for a drink in the manager's office afterwards. So mm. it's, it's nowhere near as confrontational as it sometimes mm. appears. Mm. I guess on the other side of the coin then, before the interview, Maybe not as, like are you saying, as frosty um, altercation as this might have been, but do you ever get managers that say to you, okay, I, this, have, this happened, we know it happened, but I don't want you to ask me about this, where you might feel like, oh, I could have got a really good interview out of that? No, that, that doesn't happen anymore, because let's say, let's say a manager appears before me, and says, and it's happened before, and it says, right, uh, we know 
X happened, but I, I'm not going to talk about it. My sense, yeah, I'll say absolutely no problem at all. That's your prerogative not to talk about it, and I respect your right. But it's my job to ask about it. So you can't you can't interview somebody who doesn't want to be interviewed. So whatever the incident is or whatever's happened, if they don't want to talk about it, that's fine. So you say, look, I need to ask you about so and so. Manager says, I'm not prepared to talk about it. You might you judge it. You might follow it up with a supplementary, but do you not think it's important? You discuss this, and then manager will then a little bit more curtly say, I'm not prepared to talk about it. That's fine. It's no problem at all. As long as you ask about it. Um, the only editorial judgment you've got to make is the subject nature. Because there'll be some things, which may be, I don't know, maybe on social media, but not mainstream media. And therefore, they're not relevant for you to ask about. And you would have made an error by bringing them up with said manager at that time and place as well. It's got to, in any good interview, there's got to be a rapport and there's got to be respect between the two parties. And you've always got to try and maintain that respect. Always. Mm. Has there ever been situations that perhaps you regret in that sense? Because certainly there's been situations where you've sort of been presented with unnecessary difficulty. And there's also been situations where sort of, through no fault of your own, you've perhaps caused issue. Let's say um, the interview with Ivanovic, for example, after the Champions League semi-final, obviously you didn't know that he didn't know that he would therefore not be able to be in the, in the final. And obviously he had no idea. And so you end up with this situation where he gets stunned with this knowledge in the middle of the interview. Is there, is there, is these sort of like teachable moments or are there sort of any regrets or that kind of thing? How do you reflect back on maybe moments like that where there's been sort of difficulty? Well, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, there haven't been many moments like that. Mm. I mean, that was you, the part you missed out there as well was that not only did he not realize that he wouldn't be playing in the final, he didn't actually express very clearly that he. Uh, wasn't he, he actually understood that he wasn't going to be playing in the final? That wasn't clear either. Mm. There was a whole thing. But do do I wish it gone differently? Of course I do. Absolutely, of course I do. Was <laughs> none of it was intentional uh, in terms of the way it panned out. It was a, an extreme set of circumstances. But you know, hindsight is a wonderful gift. When you when you're live and you're on television or radio you you don't get a second chance once it's out it's out so you have to prepare yourself as well as possible try and put yourself in a position where you don't make those types of errors left right and center which you know people do make mistakes it happens it happens um fun out there bran and i we spoke we spoke privately and in fact when uh, you may or may not remember he scored winning goal in the Europa League final, I think it was the following season. And as soon as the game had finished, I texted him and I said, thank God. I said, you will now rem quite rightly be remembered at Chelsea <laughs> as a goal scorer in a European final and not for that so-and-so interview. And he, he texted <laughs> straight back, laughing emojis. And he, he honestly really nice quiet humble guy he would have hated all the fuss around it he, 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 he I, I, I obviously spoke to him and said no do i need to speak to you he, he was like no i'm fine it's no big deal i'm really not bothered about it at all hmm. uh, might have been a difficult time for him but if i remember correctly it was also a difficult moment for you that interview because if i remember you you didn't expect branis lovanovic to be presented to you I think it was the UEFA team that brought him to you and you was expecting somebody else. Yeah, well, he was, he was right. on the end of, of Ash and Petr Cech, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, but again, if you're, if you're, there's a great saying in TV, I'm, listen, I'm not looking for sympathy here. Um, it, it's an incident that happened. It's well documented. It's well talked about. And I'll never duck it. I'm always happy to talk and I'll talk about the circumstances surrounding it. Am I annoyed or irritated by the criticism about it? Not remotely, because 
to a degree, if you put your head above the parapet, you're entitled to be shot at. I'm the one who wanted to be the reporter. I'm the one who wanted to ask the questions. Mm. It's down to me to get it right. Fair enough. And I mean, on to slightly more positive things. Um, bringing it back to sort of a more Liverpool-centric area. Are there any players who you, or I mean, obviously Klopp is a major personality who covered that. Are there any players that you just love, love to interview? Not necessarily from Liverpool even. Are there any d- that just really stand out to you as individuals yeah, where like, you always get a good answer? And... Oh, loads, loads and loads and loads of players. Um, because, you know, mo- and they vary. You know, footballers are like society. Some are quiet, some are loud, some are funny, some are serious. Um, some you have strong relationship with and you will message each other and speak to each other outside individual games. Others you don't really know that well and it's a fairly straightforward professional job. But no, absolutely. There's, there are so many... People don't realise... Again, people... They, they, there is a stereotype of footballers in, in many, many ways. But, you know, I, I will say about the football... Not, to the wider public, not necessarily the footballing public. Footballers are like society in my mind. 80% are pretty straightforward, ordinary people, although they do an extraordinary job. Pretty, you know, normal people, I would describe them as. 15 or 18% are absolutely sensational, whether it be funny, generous, warm-hearted, uh, real, who are just great, great to be around, and to, who do fantastic things. And then you've got a very, very small number, a very, very small number, who maybe attract negativity. But the noise around that negativity is out of context with their numbers. Thankfully, it's it's reversing, and it's been really, really good to see the efforts of a lot of top-level footballers now, and, and lower down as well, the difference they're making in society, the, their initiatives, their foundations, their charities. And it's not just pleasing to see because it's what they should do. I'm not saying that. What I find pleasing is having been in the game for so long, I've known the footballers have been doing this type of thing for years and years and years. And I'm just pleased at long last now, they're getting the credit for it. They're getting the recognition. They don't do it for the credit. They don't do it for the recognition. But nearly all of them, they know how fortunate they are to be athletes, professional athletes and well-rewarded athletes. And they do this because they want to do it. I just think it's, it's heartwarming that now they're getting the credit that they deserve. Like you said, Jeff, you've been in the in the journalism and media um, scene for a good number of years now. Um, how have you seen this industry change over the years? Because obviously now we have social media. There's a lot more interaction between fans and um, players, managers these days. Is how different is it now to when you first started out? In some ways, it's like. In some ways, it's very different. In some ways, it's like chalk and cheese. But then I would also say, when I joined, it was very different from 10 years before that. And ten, So like any industry, it evolves. I think one of the, the, one of the things that has definitely changed is that I think that fans uh, have far more information available to them now, are far more interactive, and are far more knowledgeable. Not to say that the previous generations of fans weren't knowledgeable the fans now just have a greater amount of knowledge and they you, you know you, everyone everybody in the media has had to up their ante um because fans not just their thirst for knowledge but their level of knowledge as well has, has risen enormously it's interesting um, you bring that one up actually because obviously there's been a major rise in sort of the social media and alternate sort of platform sort of sports coverage you've got on the one side you've got like sort of the smaller podcasts like like us but then you go all the way up to people like sort of the kickoff now currently they've just landed a massive deal with twitch on their sort of alternate 
uh, sports coverage. What, what do you make of sort of this kind of almost a shift? Because even on Sky, you've got people like Chunks coming on on Sunday Supplement and really pushing sort of the YouTube side on, the, on sort of that side. What do you make of that kind of what seems to be almost a slowly shifting paradigm? Well, I think there's room. I think there's room for everybody, um, and it, what it is, it's, it's bespoke television, because and it's again, it's not just in football, it's in society, and it's in certainly in the, the medium of television as well. People are looking to consume in a different fashion nowadays. People are looking to consume in a manner that they feel befits them and they're most comfortable with. So if that's with presenters and guests who they can relate to more, then they should have, they should have that choice. Absolutely. I, I, listen, the bottom line is if people are engaging and watching it, that means there is a demand. So if there is a demand, why wouldn't you give it to them? And is there any advice that you'd give anybody looking to get into this industry? I, I, I get asked this a lot. Um, my advice would be, is if you think you want to do it, do it. You know, try. Don't be, it seems like from the outside, a glamorous job, uh, an exciting job, uh, top level sport. So there must be that many people trying to do it it's, it's not always glamorous and it's not it's not always as exciting as it would appear from the outside but all i would say is don't let uh, that that put you off in terms of because oh, on that basis we would never have any new reporters we'd have no new uh, media people it's like somebody i say it's like somebody wants to be in a in a band or who wants to be a movie star or wants to be a an internationally renowned architect. Just because the battle to get there is so intense and so difficult, don't let that put you off. Otherwise, we never, you know, and you'll find out on your journey uh, as to how much you really want to do it. Now, you might, you might be the best and it not make it for different reasons. That's that's true. There's no guarantees. But based on my own experiences, the career that I've had, I would say absolutely go for it. It's a, a fantastic world. I like the media. I like working in the media. I like media people as well. And I would encourage anybody, I would encourage anybody, absolutely have a go, have a go at it because there is this, this great fun. And I always think as well, I agree with the old saying, and it definitely applies to me. If you love what you do for a living, you'll never do a day's work in your life. Mm. So it's, we get this question a lot, especially with sort of special guests of your stature when they come on. And the one thing I always think of is... You see, it, what does that the, mean? <laughs> <laughs> of your immense personality and quality, shall we put it that way. <laughs> um, but I always think of, uh, there's a quote from, of course, Jurgen Klopp where he says, and I think he's talking, it may be before the Barca game or something like that. It was around the time where we were about to win, go on to win the Champions League. And he says, um, listen, you can try your hardest and not get anything. But the only way that you will get anything is by trying your hardest. So I think it's just about always giving, sort of giving it that go and giving it that proper try and finding out if you like it because if you like if you like it great but you won't get anything by not trying no no not at all be prepared for setbacks uh, expect those setbacks try in advance to work out how you can deal with those setbacks and it needs it's very simple it needs hard hard work it needs a degree of ability and it also needs an awful lot of luck. And that's what you have to have. And that's the same as in most industries. Now, I definitely, I would say, I majored on the hard work and the luck far more than I did on the ability. But it's, you know, you, 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 if, you don't, if you don't give it your best, there, there'll be somebody at your elbow 
who will try harder and will, is far more likely to succeed than you. I guess moving on to a slightly different topic that I'm sure is very close to you, um, mental health. Um, you're an advocate of mental health and we've seen organisations such as MIND collaborate with the EFL recently um, to help promote um, the issue and uh, I guess the idea of mental health where a lot of people in this country might not be quite as informed as uh, we probably should be and especially in regards to men's mental health. Um, could you give us an insight to some of the work that you do um, with regards to promoting mental health? Well, I'm evangelical about it because, unfortunately, I suffered um, a short spell. It was nearly two years. I suffered from depression, which was brought about by uh, a medical condition, an operation. It wasn't a, uh, a genetic thing. Uh, it wasn't related to anything other than the physical happening in my life. And it was a very, very difficult time for me. It was a journey of discovery as I worked out what it was. Uh, and I had huge support from people around me and I came through the other side. Now, I subsequently, as I say, I am evangelical about it. I have spoken about it publicly before when I've hosted the debate show. We've had people on talking about mental health issues. Um, and I try and encourage people where possible to seek help and to be open about it. What happened to me personally, I will never, ever be able to say, I'm glad it happened. Of course, I can't ever say that. But there's a big part of me isn't sorry that it did happen because it makes you realise how fortunate you are. It makes you realise how it's, it's quite a humbling thing to happen to you. It also makes you more mindful of other people's struggles, more, you know, mindful of why somebody is, you know, but let's just say this Sunday at Anfield and there's player a free the side, Liverpool or Leicester, plays poorly, gets hooked on 60 minutes and he'll get low marks in the paper. And, and with social media, uh, he will probably be vilified. It, now, it may, it may well be. It's not guaranteed, of course not. It is possible that he's struggling at the moment with something. So I'm not, you can't say mental health is the reason for poor performance all the time of course you can't but what we need to bring into the conversation is whether or not it is a possibility because previously it was it would just not have been discussed at all at mm. any i think i mean the very fact that still in this country the biggest killer of men under the age of 45 is suicide that that demonstrates that horrific statistic demonstrates to you the scale of the problem we've got a problem we've got a problem and we need to we need to help these people how important do you think that work is especially now you know people are dealing with COVID-19 itself people are dealing with the lockdowns and sort of potential other knock-on issues that are secondarily coming from COVID people losing their jobs Surely now more than ever is a time where mental health needs to be, what if not the focus, then just a singular major focus. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd say. I'm not sure. I'd say it's more important or less important. What I would say is because that that almost demeans or uh, means it, it takes superiority in this time frame, which I wouldn't say that it's. It has always been, whether it's recognised as important is, is a different conversation. What I would say is, and I think this is what you're alluding to, right now we are going to see, and we are seeing, a huge increase in problems in that area. So if we're not addressing it properly and being open about it in the first place, then a problem will get much bigger because we, we aren't dealing with it in the right way. Mm. Uh, before I move on to our final segment, I just had to say thank you to yourself, Jeff, for being so open and speaking to us about it. Because uh, even for myself, when I've struggled with things, seeing people like you and others in the media, just to make you know that it's good to talk about these things. And like, even if it's your friends, your family, no matter how minor it is, it sh shouldn't be stigmatised that, oh, it's mental health, you just keep it to yourself. It's, 
it's really it good to see two people like yourself making of a bigger deal of it. It cannot be a taboo subject. Mm. I'd like Definitely. to I'd like to echo that as well. And I'd just like to say to all our listeners, the uh, Anfield Talk Twitter DMs are always open. If you're struggling, speak up. We will listen. You know, this is an unprecedented time. And so don't struggle alone. Definitely. So now moving on to our last segment, the question and answers from our followers, which I'm sure they'll all be eager to get these answered by yourself, Jeff. Um, the first one we have is from Jumping Jotter 20. Um, what is your favourite interview? I'm sure you've been asked this one before. It's easy. <laughs> favourite interview is with the winning manager. <laughs> <laughs> Love you know, that. Makes a job, makes a job much easier, doesn't it? It's not about it being easy. No. The, the, <laughs> there's no such perfect interview. I've never done the perfect interview. You can always improve them. The, the ones you like, the ones that are live, the one where you've had to react to something where it's, and you're getting information uh, from them, not necessarily a news hound sense, but you're getting, it could be emotion, it could be joy. So, you know, you think about it. Uh, I think Liverpool, I was there, cup final, when they beat Arsenal. So those post-match interviews, obviously I was there in Istanbul. So those post-match interviews... You know, you imagine being the first person that they speak to media-wise, the players and manager. Just brilliant. Just see, the adrenaline rush is just absolutely brilliant. Fantastic. Those are the times. Those are great fun. Those are great to be involved in. Big occasions. Okay. Next one's uh, from Harris. Slightly different uh, tack here. What is the process <laughs> of recording and working on the FIFA games? Because obviously you've become almost an urban legend in terms of your voice lines <laughs> getting involved in sort of the injury side of the game on in the FIFA games, and you've sort of become a big personality on that. Definitely a cult hero. Yes. Could you could you could you qualify the expression almost an urban legend? Is is that what they call damned by faint praise? Possibly. Uh, essentially, <laughs> you're just a major major part of sort of almost. the. Almost an urban legend. <laughs> <laughs> You've reached a sort of mythical status. In, in, in... I, I understand. <laughs> well done. You're nearly famous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, trust me, you're definitely famous. Um, but yes, yeah, so what is the process of uh, recording and working on those FIFA games? Easy. I went into a booth about 10 years ago, said a whole load of things, recorded it, and I've never been back since. Piece of cake. So there's that very interesting. So there's no sort of you don't have the incremental no. updates. No, no. <laughs> That's just EA Sports being lazy. <laughs> yes, we we have our thoughts on that. <laughs> um, next question. I guess this is kind of related something you spoke to earlier about. There's some questions that even if the manager says they don't really want to talk about it, you still have to do your job and ask it. Uh, Michael's asking. Is it hard or uncomfortable asking managers questions about getting the sack if they're on a poor run of form? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, again, it's you have to judge whether or not that's appropriate. Um, and at what point? I mean, normally there's chatter going into the game, isn't there, in the media uh, about whether or not a manager is under pressure. It's never, it's never good. Uh, what I would say is, in the early days. I'd probably ask a manager whether or not they're feared, you know, they're concerned about their future. Maybe once, maybe twice every couple of years. Now, it's, it's at what point in the season are you asking a manager that question? But what you have to remember, what you have to remember is, the bloke stood in front of you. He's, uh, he's doing his best. He doesn't prepare a team to lose deliberately. So it's not something he personally has done wrong. Sometimes, you know, you've, it's very important to remember that it's uh, a, a guy, a professional, a fellow professional stood in front of you. So even when you are discussing those things, you must maintain that level of respect uh, and, and also only hope for, for good things for him. But quite often the, the scenario is he knows, you know, and the club's owners know as well. It's unfortunately, it's part of the game. Football managers get sacked and they get asked about it. End of. Mm. 
next one here from uh, Judy Mania. Certainly something I believe I would struggle with in your position. How hard is it to contain your ex- excitement when you see s- just something incredible happen on the pitch? So, sort of your reaction to that uh, Salah rocket against Chelsea has sort of got a lot of traction. Is it, is it is that one of the more difficult aspects of the game, sort of maintaining that sort of yeah, but it's nothing, lack it's nothing of partisanship more. and that kind of thing? Yeah, because if you like football, if you don't get excited by something like that, then you shouldn't be working in football. It was an amazing goal, brilliant goal. So I, I, I make no apology for that. The only thing you've got to be careful of is you obviously don't do it too indiscreetly or too close to the opposition team. Because trust me, they, they weren't having the same thoughts. So you've got, to, you've got to try and show some professional courtesy. But no, you, absolutely, you should uh, enjoy those moments. And also as well, if you, if you in post-match interviews, often you'll say to the player, I mean, I don't use the expression, talk us through the goal. But I, I would imagine when I spoke to Mo after that game, it would be on the long lines of that. Was just, and you'll be able to hear you know, the excitement in my voice. That was just an absolutely true hit. As soon as you hit it, did you think that's top corner? Did you know as soon as you hit it? Because it was an exceptional goal from an exceptional player. So those, those are the things we love. We love those moments. And a question from Lemmy. What's the top three moments you've witnessed in football in person? Oh, my word. <laughs> nice, easy question to round it off here. <laughs> uh, can't, can't be too much to choose from. <laughs> Um, I don't. I don't know. I'd probably go. I'd probably go Aguero, uh, Istanbul, and Newcamp. In any particular order, or in that order, or just sort of those are the those are the three that are beyond the others. Those, those, those are the three. Those are the three that come to mind. <laughs> well, it's a pretty good list. <laughs> Blimey. Um, yeah. I guess one more question from me, from myself. Um, working for Sky, is Chris Kamara as eccentric off camera as he is on it? Uh, no. <laughs> Over the years, I've not actually worked with Chris that much. Mm. Uh, but no, he's. he's he, Chris is, Chris is great fun. And, of course, people he's got a huge personality. Uh, and that's what people love about him. But you can, you can also have a serious conversation. Very much have a serious course, conversation. Yeah, yeah and, he's a, he's, and he's, a th- he's a thoughtful person as well. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't say he is as eccentric off camera, but, but I would also say he's so bubbly. <laughs> <laughs> That is by no means an act. That's Chris. That's what Chris's, yeah. person, that's what Chris's personality is like. Well, I guess that's going to bring our podcast to a close today. Jeff, thank you very much for coming on to the show. Did you enjoy yourself? Very much so, boys. Very much so. It's yeah. always, I always think, you know, like the old advert says, it's, it's good to talk. Um, and I think shows like this i think they're important i think um like i said to earlier there's a, there's a place for everybody in the media so it, it, i can only hope you continue to build your audience uh and your content and the fact that you enjoy doing it as well it's fantastic it's absolutely fantastic so wherever possible i will always you know come on, let's let's be brutally honest here i'm a very very lucky boy to do what I do. So if anything I've said has been, if, if within that last hour we've spoken, there might be 30 seconds that's worth repeating to anybody and they get something out of it, then good, I'm glad. Thank you very much for taking this with me. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and to our listeners, just like to say, thank you very much for listening. Please get involved in the conversation using the hashtag TAT pod. Give us some feedback. Let us know. So maybe suggest if you want uh, Jeff to come back on with more nuggets of wisdom. Um, and yeah, 
Thank you very much and, for and, listening. And with, vid- and with video, so his good hair doesn't get put to for no use. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> yes. We'll try and have the uh, cameras on if we can get you back for another one. We'll make sure. Thank you very much, guys. guys. It was an absolute pleasure. All the best to you. Right. Thank you very much, this guys. Is, this has been the Anfor Talk podcast. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and we're out. <laughs>